Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Only in maths problems can you buy 60 cantaloupes and no one asks you what the hell is wrong with you. And of course that points out the artificiality of so many kinds of mathematics problems, um, that at least in, in, uh, when I was growing up, but still today. In my classes, and I teach a class called Mathematics in Nature amongst other things, I, I'm so frustrated by students who walk around campus with cell phones, mobile phones, stuck to their ears. And um, I say, look, the greatest free show on earth is going on above your head. So don't do this. Keep your eyes open. Uh, look around, except while driving or operating um, heavy machinery. So you never know what you may see. Um, I want to introduce you to Fermi problems, using guesstimation to uh, get some ideas about number of dental offices or eating, how, uh, eating places in a city. A little bit about travel speeds and times, power laws of city growth, and then something called taxicab geometry. Enrico Fermi, a very famous phys theoretical physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project. He had this amazing capacity for doing problems on the back of an envelope, or indeed in his head, that took mathematicians maybe weeks and weeks and weeks with their calculating machines. And he would get the rough order of magnitude, and that was often all he needed, a ballpark figure. Uh, by order of magnitude, I mean to within a power of 10. So factors of two or three are not important with these kind of problems you want to be within the nearest power of 10. It doesn't work if you're doing taxes, of course, so you have to apply different techniques. But the classic Fermi problem is how many piano tuners are there in New York City? Well, what a silly question. Who on earth wants to know that? But the point is that by breaking a seemingly complex problem down into uh, r smaller sub-problems and with some plausible assumptions and basic arithmetic, you can get a ballpark figure. And the point I try to get across to students is that, okay, these are some of these questions are very silly, but some are very practical. And the it's the techniques that's important. You don't need to sort of shake your, your head and say, oh, we can't possibly do that. Well, we can if we, if we make uh, reasonable assumptions. Now, in what follows, uh, were you to do the problem, we'd, you'd probably make slightly different assumptions from me, but I suspect that at the end of the calculation, we'd both be within a factor of 10 of the answer, which we hope is within a factor of 10 of the correct answer. So geometric mean is a rather unusual measure of an average compared with the arithmetic mean. Now let's just deal with two numbers, two positive numbers. The arithmetic mean, of course, is the sum of the numbers divided by two. The geometric mean is the, square, is the product of those numbers, and you take the square root of that. So the geometric mean of three positive numbers would be the cube root of the product of all three, and so on. Well, this is important because uh, when you're dealing with very large differences of scale, size, orders of magnitude, the arithmetic mean is not terribly useful. The arithmetic mean it is never less than the geometric mean. So let's take one number to be 1 and the other one to be 10,000, conveniently chosen. The arithmetic mean is just a tad over 5,000, isn't it? Um, and that is therefore just over 5,000 times the lower number and just under half the upper number, so there's an imbalance there, arithmetically. The geometric mean, the square root of the product, is the square root of 10 to the power 4, which is 100. And 100 is midway between these two numbers, A and B, in a geometric sense. The upper number divided by 100 is 100, and 100 divided by the lower number is 100. So geometrically, it's midway between the two. And uh, here's a pic picture of a circle with a right angle triangle in this semicircle. And um, if this distance, if you draw a vertical line of length h at some point along the diameter, then the lesser, I've called lesser distance x1 and the rest of the diameter x2, then the geometric mean, it follows from simple proportion, is actually h. This distance is the square root of this times this. And as you m slide h along towards this point, where it becomes a radius, of course, there the geometric mean and the arithmetic mean are the same because the diameter divided by 2 is just the radius. So you can see why this distance is less than or equal to 
the arithmetic mean. The Goldilocks principle is essentially using this idea of the geometric mean. Is it too small? Is it too large? Or is it just right? So you have to think about that. And in this case, you can fit more than one person into a Volkswagen Beetle or bug and fewer than 100. We take the geometric mean, 10. That's about right. Well, of course, we can't be accurate because, exact, because it depends on the size of the people and, and so on and how close you're prepared to get. But that's about right. We're only in these problems interested in the right order of magnitude. In other words, this may be a factor of two or three out, which I rather doubt in this case. But uh, 20 or 30 wouldn't be a major problem with this kind of mindset. Okay? We're only interested in the nearest power of 10. So let's go back to this New York City problem. Okay, how many people are in New York City? Well, more than a million, I know that, and fewer than 100 million. I will use the Goldilocks principle, square root of the product, geometric mean, to, to guess 10 million. How many p families are there in a city of 10 million people? Well, you can have family units of one, up to 10 probably, but I took five, just some kind of average, because I can e divide by five relatively easy. That gives me 2 million units, families. Does every family own a piano? No, let's use the geometric uh, uh, the Goldilocks principle. Uh, more than 1% and fewer than 100. Uh, so we'll take the geometric mean, 10%. So we'll divide that 2 million by 10 to get 200,000. Again, this figure 2 is suspect. So how many piano tuners are needed? Well, uh, some people never get around to tuning their piano. Some tune it regularly. Um, I assumed, on average, a piano gets tuned about once a year. So that's about 200,000 a year, give or take. What about piano tuners? How many can they do in a day? Well, I, I assume sort of two, allowing for travel time, office time, and so on. Uh, 50 weeks, five working days, 250 working days a year, which means that our, our piano tuner, let's call him Fred, can do about 500 a year. So we divide that into the 200,000 and get 400. Now, again, the four, what it means really is this is probably more than 100 and fewer than 1,000. Okay, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, now, doomsday. 1960, this, this, uh, in, the science, in the journal Science, this, this title appeared. Okay, doomsday, Friday the 13th, of course, November AD 2026. And beneath it was the sentence, at this date, human population will approach infinity if it grows as it has grown in the last two millennia. And a related paper, much more recently, gave us this, humanity has just crossed a major landmark in its history with the majority of people now living in cities. Okay? And it was produced by, written by some authors at uh, the Los Alamos Center for Nonlinear Science. Growth, innovation, and scaling, and the pace of life in cities. They came to the conclusion that large cities are faster, in a sense that they define, to be, than small cities. They um, characterized diverse properties of city life by um, a power law, basically, whatever the property is that you're interested in, and we'll see some examples, varied as some power B of the population. Population is a function of time. So this, this, uh, if B is greater than one, as they found for innovation, uh, research, and so on, if B is greater than one, roughly one or less than one, B about one is associated with individual human needs, domestic uh, features. B less than one, which means it's growing more slowly than linear, is d d deals with economies of scale associated with infrastructure, roads, and so on. B greater than one is this aspect of innovation, social returns uh, with population size, wealth, and so on. And just to illustrate, before we get to look at some examples, um, I've got here B is three-fourths less than one, which is this red curve, plotting Y against N. Uh, and this is the linear curve, where B is 1, that's blue, and then 5 fourths, slightly greater than 1, increasing faster than linear. And so what they found was, in particular, these are the values of B, private research and devel uh, development employment, overall research and development employment, total wages, total bank deposits, total electrical consumption, new AIDS cases, serious crimes. These have, um, they grow as the corresponding power of the population, so it's more than one. 
the domestic area, these are close to one, very close to one, total housing, total employment, household electrical consumption, and water consumption, close to one, linear, and then significantly less than one, petrol stations, petrol sales, length of electrical cables, and they listed a whole lot more. And they go on to say, and there's several other papers, it's estimated that 2,000 years ago, the population of the world was approximately 300 million. For a long time, didn't grow significantly, but then it took 1,600 years after that for the world to double to 600 million. And if you continue on, it reached a billion in, in 1804, uh, 204 years later, 2 billion in 27, 123 years later, 3 billion in 60, 33 years later, 4 billion in 74, 14 years, 5 billion in 87, 6 billion in 1999. And uh, according to the um, World Health Organization, on October the 31st, 2011, we reached 7 billion. There's some concerns about um, the social impact of that. All right, taxicab geometry, a two dimensional non Euclidean geometry. The taxicab metric, if you want to go from here to here, basically uh, assumes that we have a grid, which a lot of American cities uh, are laid out on a grid, uh, instead of the Euclidean distance from A to B, which is the straight line there as the crow flies. You just use any particular form, it will have the same distance, no matter what zigzag you choose. That's that that's the taxicab distance. In taxicab geometry, pi is four. The definition from Euclidean geometry, if you carry it over, circle circumference over circle diameter is pi. Well, what we've got here, here's a Euclidean circle of radius three. Here's a taxicab circle of radius three. Because if you want to go from the center there to any point on the red perimeter, you have to go three units, three straight up, or if you want to go to this, one up, two across, or two across, one up. It's three, it's three units. I've got some idealized mathematical models of city growth based on uh, uh, really the similarity between um, uh, the structure of a star, which is a balance, a stable star's balance between gravitation, pulling it in, and gas pressure, pushing it out. Well, there's no physical uh, attractions for cities in this sense, but we think about living near the center might um, uh, be attractive, but then housing costs uh, might be high, so that's tending to push you out. You want the convenience, but you don't want the costs. So in these mathematical models, highly idealized, um, there's a circularly symmetric geometry, independent of angle, just radius. Everything depends on distance from the center rather than the direction. Well. They may be quite helpful, as I say here, or they might may be quite useless. And there's been quite a few publications about this in the um, social sciences. But I, I found this graph. This is the growth of the built-up area of London from 1840 to 1981. But you can see the growth contours are not dissimilar from circles, in a sense. Obviously, topography makes a difference. And, uh, but it, it is intriguing to me that, that uh, this, in fact, uh, is as close to that idealized form as it is. When you move from nature to cities, isn't one of the big challenges that what happens in cities is influenced by human behavior, and human behavior is idiosyncratic? So we know from now 30 years of behavioral economics all the kind of consistent cognitive frailties that we have in relation to numbers and uh, in relation to the way we process information. Um, in fact, it was interesting you were talking about uh, people living in the suburbs because you probably know there's a well-known bit of research in behavioral economics where people are asked whether they would rather live in the city center with one fewer bedroom or in the outskirts with an extra bedroom. And they, generally speaking, prefer to be outskirts with an extra bedroom. But then if you actually calculate the amount of dis time they spend traveling and their net happiness, this is a very unwise decision, but the problem is the bedrooms here and now, whereas the costs of commuting are spread over 20 years and we're, uh, the mm. human discount rate isn't very accurate. So to what extent are the kinds of things that you're describing vulnerable to the fact that human beings are not actually very mathematically consistent in their behavior? It's very, very sensitive to things like this. Let me just point out that en masse, while as individuals, human behavior is hard to predict. On mass, there are, there are many 
mathematical models that can be quite accurate predicting you know, with probabilistic and statistical uh, accounts of, of behavior, whether it's not just a, a swarm of humans, but a swarm of bees, a, a swarm of birds, flocking behavior in, uh, and, and shoaling in fish. But um, you're talking more about really the individual who's trying to uh, guesstimate how they should, where they should live, uh, how they should work out the, the economics of this. Is that, in fact, the case? Yeah, and, and those kind of feedback loops. So we know, for example, in transport yes. systems, that any attempt to improve a transport system is liable to be self-defeating because you improve the transport system and more people flock to it because it goes better, so it stops being any better. Yes, kind of yes. Well, as, as some kind of, yes, sort of... Uh, feedback mechanism, as you, as, as you said. Yeah, well, but that can be taken into account in a lot of non-linear models. Again, crudely, probably. But um, it's, uh, if you were to plot um, the population growth of a particular, let's talk about if you have an environment in which ecological niche has limited resources, and so the population will grow until the point those resources are being consumed uniformly, and unless you do something else, that population will remain there. So it's, I'd like to use the example, um, we get quite a lot of hurricanes coming up the east coast of the states. Now, if you want to go and buy uh, radio batteries uh, or, or flashlight torch batteries, normally you can do that. But once there's a hurricane coming, everybody's out to get the batteries and you find the resources have uh, actually vanished because the little old ladies are in there knocking people over to get to the, to, to get to the battery section. And so um, normally, the population, uh, th there's this balance, but, but when you have extremes like that, the, uh, uh, the things change. So you have to, you can incorporate more sophisticated models to account for that, but really, um, human behavior is human behavior, and we can never uh, uh, be as accurate as we would like to. Is it your sense that the policymakers often want a kind of bogus certainty? They want to be given a specific figure, a particular yes. prediction yes. to give them security and it would be better for them to be told, yes, we can only give you a guesstimate. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I would think that uh, that's even more important, uh, even more uh, relevant to politics. Uh, it, just give me an answer that I can, I can use to, to bend to my own ends. Um, yeah, and, and people are um, uncomfortable with a level of uncertainty. And uh, so uh, I think very bad decisions can, may have been made uh, in the past and will continue to be made because people opted for something certain which was meaningless as opposed to a range that would have been much more helpful.